The Pre-Failure of Religious Apologetics. This is my 100th video, and I thought it would be a good idea to do a video not just limited to one specific Christian apologetic argument, or even to Christian apologetics in general, but to speak more broadly of a fundamental problem with religious apologetics. And I hit upon this idea as I had an epiphany as I was trying to break down the presuppositional apologetic argument. And my head was spinning as I was trying to figure out where to begin here, as I was cataloging all of the different logical fallacies that are packed into one very short argument. Almost as if the apologist was trying to engineer an argument that would pack so many fallacies so tightly into one argument that it would create a singularity of stupid that would subsequently create a black hole that would suck in and devour any skeptic counter-argument. But as I was trying to catalog all of this, and I think this is a useful exercise, and I will probably go into greater detail on this in some future video, I realized that there is one core problem that exists with this argument that also exists with every other apologetic argument that I've heard, ranging from the ontological argument and the transcendental argument to arguments that are specific to Christianity, like the trilemma argument. And that is the problem of pre-failure. You have already, as the apologist, failed before you have even finished your argument and before I have even gotten started in breaking down this argument, figuring out where all the fallacies are, and pointing out where all the weaknesses are, and coming up with counter-argument. And I know this is a bold claim here, but by the end of this video, you'll understand why. First, a little bit of background here. The burden of proof lies with the person who is making the claim. And as Carl Sagan observed, the amount of evidence we typically require scales according proportionally to just how outlandish the claim is. As he put it, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Now, to any apologist who disputes this, understand that you engage in the exact same critical thinking in all areas of your life outside of your religion. Consider how you would respond to three different claims about someone's dinnertime activities, just as an example. Let's say, claim number one, someone says, I had dinner with some local friends. The nature of this claim is quite mundane. And the evidence required is usually only that person's testimony, along with the lack of any contrary evidence. The default reception is going to be acceptance. Claim number two is, I had pre dinner with the President of the United States. The nature of this claim is quite extraordinary, and it's going to be met with skepticism unless the claimant is someone extremely important, say uh, a reporter, or a head of state, or a uh, particularly powerful politician, or a particularly notable lobbyist, or something along those lines. The evidence that is going to be required goes beyond simply a friend of theirs saying, it's true, I saw the whole thing. The evidence that is going to be required is documentation from some reputable source, like, say, a newspaper article. And until that burden of proof is met, the default reception is usually going to be skepticism. Now consider claim number three. I had dinner with some deceased relatives who are back from the dead and feeling much better now. The nature of this claim is ridiculous, or to be a little bit more kind, far outside our experiences in this everyday, ordinary universe that we understand. The amount of evidence required is going to be overwhelming, to say the least. And the default reception is not even going to be skepticism, it's going to be ridicule, or a little bit more kindly, concern for the sanity of the claimant. So, of those three examples, which one best resembles religious claims, and therefore establishes the kind of proof that apologists would really need to come up with in order for us to take the claims of religion seriously? So what sort of evidence could the apologist offer that would meet the burden of proof? Well, first, most obviously, they could produce their god. And while this may seem like an outrageous demand, it is in fact quite consistent with their holy scriptures and how their holy scriptures say the universe is supposed to work. In Genesis chapter 18, Yahweh dropped by Abraham's place for lunch. In Genesis chapter 32, he wrestled with Jacob. In Exodus chapter 33 verse 11, he spoke to Moses face to face as one does to a friend. And in Judges chapter 1 verse 1 to 2, he spoke to the entire nation of Judea, apparently giving a public speech. Additionally, he spoke in the New Testament as a booming voice from the sky. 
in Luke chapter 3, verse 22, for example. He says, You are my son, this day have I begotten thee. But if the big guy can't be bothered to make any public experiences or speak to the United Nations, then surely he could at least spare a few angels to interact with human beings, as certainly his angels did in both the Old Testament and the New. For example, in Acts chapter 12, verse 23, one of the angels assassinates Herod Antipas for not giving the proper glory to Yahweh. In other examples in the New Testament, angels interact with human beings to break apostles out of jail or to let the Virgin Mary know that she is about to conceive Jesus. But if the angels can't be bothered to come down and give a talk to any skeptics, then perhaps the Christians themselves could give demonstrations of the power of their faith that would be consistent with what Jesus said we should expect to see. In Mark chapter 16, verse 17 to 18, Jesus says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and they shall drink any deadly thing, and it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So, essentially, Christians ought to be able to heal people, and this ought to be done as repeatable experiments under the rigors of medical peer review with double-blind studies so as to weed out the possibility of it being attributable only to the placebo effect. This sort of thing should be demonstrated as repeatable experimentation. Or perhaps if the uh, Christians these days lack sufficient faith, then maybe they could just produce some magical artifacts. And I'm not talking about something found in an Indiana Jones movie. I'm talking about the Bible itself. The Bible talks in Acts chapter 19, verse 12, about the magical handkerchiefs of Paul that could be used by other people to cast out evil spirits and heal the sick. Perhaps if these artifacts could be produced and given over to the scientific community, to be closely examined and subject to peer review under repeatable tests to be sure that they do in fact function as they are said to function in the Bible. This too would be hard evidence that the apologists could offer. But in fact, the apologists offer no hard evidence or indeed evidence of any kind. They can't seem to summon God to either appear or speak from the clouds anymore, even though according to them, Yahweh did so all the time up until about 2,000 years ago. Angels don't seem to be available for comment anymore, even though two-thirds of them are under the employment of Yahweh. Christians don't seem to have sufficient faith to heal or otherwise perform any miracles. And all the magical artifacts seem to be lost. So what evidence does the apologist present? You ask the apologist to make their best case for their God and for the claims of their religion. And what you will get are hypotheticals, thought experiments, philosophical arguments, mental constructs. Essentially, argument goes here, therefore Jesus. Now, please don't get me wrong. I am not suggesting that philosophical arguments aren't useful to understand our world, and neither am I suggesting that faulty philosophical arguments shouldn't be addressed by skeptics. What I am suggesting is that philosophical arguments without any supporting de demonstrations or evidence is not compelling enough to meet the burden of proof established both by the extraordinary claims of your religion as well as by your own holy scriptures and how your scriptures say the universe is supposed to work. At best, all you have, even if nobody can present a logical argument against anything you have to say, at best you have an unproven and untestable hypothesis. If philosophy without either evidence or demonstration is all you can offer, you have already failed before I even respond. Thanks for listening. Oh, and just to add, here's another proverbial thousand words on the topic for your consideration.